There are few things more baffling to the average person than what exactly a conductor does. Even conductors are sometimes hard-pressed to translate a good answer, falling back on old maestro myths that conductors are preternatural musical geniuses, that we carry a magical baton and cast spells with spectacular moves. Of course, that's not what we do at all. Being an effective conductor requires superior personal musicianship, trained audiation skills, an aesthetic imagination, a gestural vocabulary, and a driving spirit of lifelong curiosity and learning. Conductors manage a comprehensive system of diverse instruments, with difficult physical abilities and limitations, using a symbol-based notation system, communicated through iconic gestures, producing sound, and all in real time. It's not quite magic, but when it's done well, the effect is extraordinary. We're going to spend this semester gaining an understanding of those complexities and practicing the skills required to manage them. One of the most daunting challenges for many beginning conductors is comprehending the full score. After all, if we're instrumentalists by training, we've only ever been playing from our individual part. And if we're vocalists by training, we've usually only read from a choral score, perhaps with a keyboard reduction or accompaniment. The sheer size of the orchestral score, and all of the information it includes, can be intimidating. But unlike the choral score or the individual instrumental part that we might use in both rehearsal and performance, we need to think of the conductor's score as an architect's blueprint. The score itself isn't music, just as a building's blueprint isn't the skyscraper. We'll discuss this more later in the semester, but for now, let's dive in. The orchestra as we know has come a long way since the first conductor, Jean-Baptiste Lully, who stabbed himself in the foot with his time-beating rod and died of gangrene. Thank goodness we use little sticks in the air now. The orchestra today is a relatively modern conception a band of disparate instruments playing together. It has grown in terms of the physical strength of the instruments as well as in size over the last few hundred years. The ensemble is comprised of families of similar instruments, strings, brass, winds, and percussion. Generally speaking, they sit together for cohesiveness of playing and how they best like to hear one another. This is dictated by the physics of sound an entire string orchestra sawing away is still no match for a single trombone player with a chip on his shoulder. This is why we tend to seat strings at the front, closest to the audience, and brass and percussion toward the back. It's also why you might see as many as 18 first violins, but only one tuba. Wind players prefer to sit in two rows, with double reeds together as a two-row unit, bassoons behind oboes, and clarinets behind the flutes. Violin, viola, and cello players sit together in groups of two called desks. They usually share a music stand at each desk. Because of the size of the double bass, sharing a stand would cause inadvertent sword fights. So they use their own music stand. The first violinist is called the concertmaster. They function as the leader of the entire orchestra and sometimes as a translator between what a conductor wants and what the orchestra can do. They sit immediately to the left of the conductor at the front of the orchestra. And in choral orchestral music, the choir is usually seated on risers behind the orchestra, where both singers and instrumentalists can hear each other best. Aside from sitting together, the instrument families are also organized together in the full score by brackets. You might notice that the instruments are generally listed from highest to lowest voice within each family. For winds, this means flute, oboe, clarinet, and bassoon. Then come the horns, who sometimes identify more with the woodwinds, and at other times as part of the brass section. They have their own bracket. Next come the brass, trumpets, trombones, and tuba. Then percussion, both pitched, like the timpani, on a staff, and unpitched, like bass drum, on a percussion line. Followed by harp, sometimes chorus, and strings, first and second violins, violas, cellos, and double basses. It's important to note that as orchestral music was composed throughout English, Germanic, Italian, Russian, and French-speaking countries, the instruments themselves, and even the technique and expression directives in the score, would be named according to the language of the composer. So to this day, you might find very different looking and sounding names for the same old clarinet. Commit these names to memory, 
and begin to practice the number one rule of score reading. If there's a foreign musical term you don't know, look it up and write it in. Remember, this score is now your blueprint for learning and synthesizing this music. So break the spine on that score binding and start marking away. You don't want to be caught giggling to yourself on the podium the first time you want to address the oboe in a work by Ravel. The shorthand for orchestra instrumentation is a series of numbers that outline how many instruments are called for a given piece of music. This is helpful when you might be looking for other works that share instrumentation in order to fill out a concert program. The shorthand is listed in score order, from top to bottom and separated by dashes. Two, 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 four, three, three, one, timp, strings, would mean two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, four horns, three trumpets, three trombones, one tuba, timpani, and strings. Larger orchestras will abbreviate additional instruments with their closest orchestral family. Three plus pick, three plus cor ang, three plus bass, three plus contra, four, four, three plus bass, one, timp, 16, 14, 12, 10, 8, would mean three flutes plus piccolo, three oboes plus English horn, three clarinets plus bass clarinet, three bassoons plus contrabassoon, four horns, four trumpets, three trombones plus bass trombone, one tuba, timpani, and then 16 first violins, 14 second violins, 12 violas, 10 cellos, and eight double basses. The instruments of the orchestra were not all invented in the same time or place, and so they don't naturally play in the same fixed keys. And anyone who reads music knows it's much easier to play notes on a staff than on extended ledger lines, so different clefs allow instruments to read their best notes in the middle of the staff. We'll start with the most common clef, G clef, or treble clef. Notice how the clef serifs around the G line of a treble staff. C clef, used for viola, trombones, and sometimes high cello parts, and depending on which line it falls on the staff might be called alto or tenor clef. The horizontal staff line through the middle of the clef becomes C. F clef is sometimes called bass clef. The scroll and two dots outline the F line in the staff. This too needs to be committed to memory and there are keyboard exercises that can be played to practice your clef reading skills in real time. There are a few things that cause more consternation among aspiring musicians than instrumental transposition. But like many seemingly confusing things about music theory, if you've struggled to understand it in the past, there's a good chance it just hasn't been explained very well. As long as you understand intervals, instrument transposition is actually incredibly simple. Let's take a look. First of all, there are a lot of C instruments, or non-transposing instruments, or instruments that transpose at the octave, so at least the note you see on the page is the note that sounds. Flute, oboe, bassoon, trombone, tuba, timpani, keyboards, and strings. These are all C instruments. Rule number one. Everything relates to C. And there are two types of conductor scores. C scores, where every instrument, regardless of transposition, appears in the same key, and transpose scores, where you as the conductor see what each player actually has printed in their part. There's a simple way to determine which kind of score you have. If transposing instruments such as clarinets and horns have different key signatures than non-transposing instruments, like violins and flutes, then you have a transpose score. Again, everything relates to C. So an instrument named with a note that isn't C, like a trumpet in B-flat, means that when a trumpet player sees a C on the staff and plays that note, what sounds like a B-flat, a whole step lower than C, comes out. When a horn in F sees a C on the page, the note they play sounds a perfect fifth lower, an F natural. Now think of the process in reverse. If you had a B-flat trumpet, and you wanted them to play a C in unison with, say, a trombone, what note would you have to write for the trumpet to achieve that perfect unison? You'd have to write a pitch a whole step above C, 
because the B-flat trumpet sounds a whole step lower than written. They would need to see a D to sound C. Let's practice with a different instrument, E-flat clarinet. The distance from a C up to E-flat is a minor third. So if you want it to sound a C, you have to write an A natural below C in the part. What if you wanted the E-flat clarinet to sound an F? Think down a minor third from F, and you'd write a D natural. See? It's easy. You might be looking at a score asking why do transposing instruments have different key signatures than non-transposing instruments? Again, the answer is simple. If the orchestra is playing a movement in the key of E-flat major, a B-flat clarinet would display a key signature a whole step above E-flat major in order for it to sound in E-flat. That would be F major. Where transposition gets tricky is invariably when we have to do it on the spot, in front of a hundred people, with the added complexities of different clefs and chord inversions. You know, it's only a matter of time before some confused horn player, <laughs> it's always a horn player, raises their hand to ask if their odd sounding note is correct in their part. And you'll be expected to know the answer right away. This is why transposition is worth spending time on. It will pay dividends later on to understand it thoroughly. But more importantly than that, it's necessary for beginning conductors to carefully analyze their scores, writing in chords and perhaps even note names above tricky clefs and transposing instruments. The objective is to gain understanding and clarity about who is doing what and how everything is functioning together at the same time. Empowered with this knowledge, you'll now be able to determine if the sound you experience in rehearsal is reflective of exactly what you've studied on the page.